Welcome to the first IVF Worldwide Online Congress in Reproductive Medicine. In this video, we would like to introduce you to our virtual congress platform. All doors, screens, and signs can be clicked to navigate to the desired congress area. To view the program click on this screen. On April 25th, top names in the field will be presenting via a live broadcast and answering your questions. The lectures can be accessed through the lecture hall. All lectures will be recorded, and made available after the live event, for those of you who are not able to attend the live sessions. Please note that in order to receive CME points, you need to attend the live broadcast. To access the exhibition area, please click on this door. The exhibition will open, one month prior to the meeting. You can access any booth by clicking on it. On April 25th, a live chat option will be available to interact with exhibitors in real time. If you have any issues, or have questions, visit us at the info desk. You are welcome to send us an email at any time to info at cme-congresses.com. We hope to see you all on April 25th at 11 a.m. Central European Time. In the meantime, we wish you all good health during these challenging times. Welcome to the first IVF Worldwide Online Congress in Reproductive Medicine. In this video, we would like to introduce you to our virtual congress platform. All doors, screens, and signs can be clicked to navigate to the desired congress area. To view the program click on this screen. On April 25th, top names in the field will be presenting via a live broadcast and answering your questions. The lectures can be accessed through the lecture hall. All lectures will be recorded, and made available after the live event, for those of you who are not able to attend the live sessions. Please note that in order to receive CME points, you need to attend the live broadcast. To access the exhibition area, please click on this door. The exhibition will open, one month prior to the meeting. You can access any booth by clicking on it. On April 25th, a live chat option will be available to interact with exhibitors in real time. If you have any issues, or have questions, visit us at the info desk. You are welcome to send us an email at any time to info at cme-congresses.com. We hope to see you all on April 25th at 11 a.m. Central European Time. In the meantime, we wish you all good health during these challenging times.
Good afternoon, good morning in certain areas. You know, we welcome you to this IVF Worldwide webinar and this very sunny spring day. And I hope despite the situation, medical situation around the world, that you're keeping safe and you're social distancing yourself and you're trying your best to help to control this pandemic. I'm Milton Leung and I'm speaking to you from Hong Kong. Today, we have very fortunate and honor to have Professor Antonio Lamarca, Professor of uh, Medical and Surgical Sciences, Child and Health, Child and Adults, University of Moderna and Reggio Emilio. He is an expert in all fields in reproductive medicine. And today, he's going to give us a talk on AMH, the importance of its clinical use. Professor Lamaka. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Milton. And uh, well, first of all, I would like to say a few words about what is happening all over the world. Uh, for sure, after the Second World War, we are facing probably the greatest challenge for humanity. We never thought that this nightmare could come true, but the reality is that in only a few weeks, uh, we found ourselves living uh, in a world of fear and the isolation. Here in Italy, the country that everyone loves, the nation of beauty, art, and culture is experiencing the bad, page, the bad page, the ugliest page of the modern era. We have thousands of uh, affected people, thousands of dead, thousands of patients needing intensive care unit. But also we have thousands of doctors and nurses who are hardly working to save lives every day. We have thousands of volunteers who go out of their way to help the weakest people. The virus is not invincible. We must remain united and optimistic. Together, we will win. Together, we will go back to our normal life. We will go back to having good time with our families and friends in our beautiful cities. Together, we will come back to stay close to each other and to celebrate life. So take care and stay safe, everybody. Uh, for those who are involved in uh, uh, IVF and reproductive medicine, we have published a few days ago an article on fertility and sterility in which we report our experience of the last weeks. We summarize there what we did in the clinical setting in order to increase safety and for patients and workers, the measures were revised more or less every day and were more and more stringent according to the spread of the infection among individuals. We think this article may be useful for those colleagues living in countries in, in which the spread of the virus is at a very early stage. Now, let's uh, go to the presentation of today. And uh, again, let me thank uh, uh, Milton and Zev for the very kind invitation. Uh, the topic today is focused on AMH. And uh, uh, well, what, what is the role of uh, AMH in the female population? And I decided to analyze the role of AMH in the general female, female population and in the infertile female population. So for the general female population, we will talk about the possibility of predicting the age of menopause and spontaneous fertility. For infertile patients, uh, we will see the predictive role of AMH for quantitative and qualitative aspects uh, in IDF. Uh, well, you know very uh, well what AMH is. Uh, it is a protein produced by granulosa cells and uh, secreted into circulation. So they, that's why you can measure AMH into the blood of your patients. Uh, and if you look at this curve, this is the decay of AMH uh, throughout female reproductive uh, 
uh, life. And this uh, uh, decay is very, very similar to what found for uh, uh, the decay in the true ovarian reserve, which is the number of primordial follicles remaining uh, into the ovaries of our patients. And the, from my uh, point of view, in my view, this is uh, uh, expression of the goodness of uh, this marker when used as a marker of ovarian reserve. Very soon after its introduction into the clinical practice, it was more or less 15 years ago, we understood that AMH may be superior uh, to FSH when uh, uh, measuring uh, uh, ovarian reserve. And this is, uh, I think, very, very uh, uh, clearly uh, demonstrated in this uh, clinical article, which was based on more than 5,000 patients. In those patients, uh, both AMH and FSH were measured. And when uh, uh, FSH was uh, uh, was uh, within the normal range, so was uh, reassuring, well, one out of five women had in reality low AMH, which was uh, indicative of reduced ovarian reserve. On the contrary, if AMH was within the normal range, only one out of 18 women had high FSH. Uh, and so again, this uh, gives the idea of the superiority of AMH when compared to uh, FSH. Uh, uh, AMH is uh, strongly related to ovarian reserve, so it may be used to predict the age at menopause, uh, why it is interesting uh, to measure, to predict the age at menopause, because early menopause is associated to reduced fertility and uh, to increased cardiovascular risk and risk for osteoporosis. On the contrary, late age uh, of menopause uh, may be associated to increased risk of uh, uh, certain tumors, including uh, breast and uh, uh, endometrial uh, cancer. That's why we want to predict the aged menopause. And many years ago, it was hypothesized that AMH can be used indeed to predict the aged menopause. The concept here is very simple. For women of similar ages, the lower the AMH values, uh, the earlier the aged menopause. And this uh, a statistical hypothesis uh, has been then tested in uh, longitudinal studies. So we have four or five very good uh, longitudinal studies nowadays. Uh, this is just one in which uh, uh, women from the Netherlands, they were prospectively uh, followed up for uh, 11 years and, uh, sorry, for 11 years. And uh, uh, well, uh, those women, experiencing menopause uh, in this time frame were those patients with uh, the lower uh, AMH uh, uh, values. Aged menopause is influenced, of course, by ovarian reserve, but also uh, different uh, acquired conditions may, may in some way uh, correlate with the aged menopause. For example, uh, smoking habits, uh, the, Smoking is associated to uh, uh, early, earlier age of menopause and uh, body weight uh, with uh, uh, low body weight being associated to an early uh, age of menopause. So some years ago, we tried to put all this information together and we created uh, some predictive model in which uh, AMH, uh, BMI and uh, smoking habit may, uh, may help all together in improve the prediction of the age of menopause. So, for example, a woman with an AMH at the uh, at a very low level, at the fifth centile, for this lady, the age of menopause uh, may be 43 if uh, she is uh, a known smoker and if she's uh, overweight, on the contrary, maybe as early as 38 uh, if she's thin and uh, uh, if she's a, a smoker. Uh, a very relevant question is whether um, AMH may be related to spontaneous fertility in the general population. One way to analyze this uh, possibility is to uh, calculate the relationship, if any, existing between AMH and the time to pregnancy. To my knowledge, this is the best study we have today. Uh, this is a prospective study. Uh, a two-year follow-up study, uh, very well done, very very well conducted in uh, in Denmark, uh, 
we have here uh, a few hundreds of women who were uh, searching for pregnancy. They received the basal AMH measurement and then they were followed up. And here in this article, others found that time to pregnancy uh, uh, decreased with uh, uh, increasing uh, uh, AMH. So in some way, this seems, uh, this seems to indicate that uh, having IMH may represent a reproductive uh, advantage in the general population. Uh, some years ago, uh, a group of uh, American researchers, uh, uh, they uh, designed a very uh, interesting study uh, the so-called time to conceive study. Uh, the objective of this study was to uh, uh, find, was to calculate uh, a possible relationship between AMH and uh, the pregnancy test. The main outcome here was the urine positive pregnancy test. And uh, they published in uh, uh, 2011 on Obstetrics and Gynecology Journal, uh, the intermediate uh, analysis of this trial. In this study, 100 women uh, were, were followed up for six months and 63% uh, of them uh, obtained the positive uh, pregnancy test. And interestingly, age, FSH and AMH were three independent predictors of the possibility of having uh, uh, the pregnancy. In particular, having an AMH lower than 0.7 nanogram uh, ml was associated to a group reduction in the possibility of obtaining uh, the pregnancy. But then this group uh, uh, came out with uh, the final result of this uh, uh, trial. This study was very well published on the JAMA article in 2017. In total, they included uh, uh, more than 700 patients in uh, this study. And when analyzing the final results, they could not confirm preliminary results. AMH and uh, neither FSH were uh, significantly associated to uh, a variability, to, 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 uh, to the possibility of having a, a spontaneous uh, positive urine, urine pregnancy test. And, uh, as you can see here, there is huge overlapping uh, between different categories of uh, uh, AMH uh, strata. And so authors concluded that biomarkers indicating diminished ovarian reserve compared with normal ovarian reserve were not associated with reduced fertility. These findings do not support the use of AMH or FSH tests to assess natural fertility for women. We must say here that this uh, uh, study had a very great impact on uh, mass media and on uh, our uh, clinical practice. But here, the outcome uh, was not the live birth, but was the uh, positive urine pregnancy test. And we knew how far is the, the, the positive pregnancy test from the, the, the live birth. Interestingly, the same group published an article on fertility and sterility uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the population here was the same used in the time to conceive study. Here, the patients were followed up uh, up to the live birth. And uh, the objective of this article was to assess whether there was an association between AMH and the miscarriage risk in that population. Well, in the, con in the time to conceive study, uh, um, 533 women were pregnant, but in the end, 24% of them experienced, experienced miscarriage. And interestingly, authors found that independently of age, having a low AMH was per se associated to a twofold increased risk of having miscarriage. And so authors, the same authors, concluded that YMH was not associated to fecundability, reduced ovarian reserve may be a risk factor for reduced reproductive potential due to its association with uh, pregnancy uh, loss. And so we may conclude that probably something may be there, there may be some association between AMH and live birth, and probably 
this topic is not closed uh, anymore and still we need uh, some uh, good perspective large study with the main outcome life birth. Let's move now to the uh, uh, IVF female population. In this population, AMH, of course, is uh, uh, useful to predict uh, the so-called quantitative aspect. And you see here uh, what we reported uh, many years ago, what has been reported uh, uh, recently by colleagues in New York. I just want to say that, uh, well, we have hundreds of articles uh, 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 dealing with AMH and the prediction of the quantitative uh, uh, aspect in, uh, in, uh, in IDF. And uh, to my knowledge, there is no one single study uh, which could not confirm the very strong, positive, and significant association existing between AMH and the number of retrieved oocytes after ovarian stimulation. That's why you can use AMH uh, to predict the two extremes uh, of ovarian response, poor response and a hyper response, which can be predicted uh, uh, very uh, pretty well by uh, uh, AMH. We uh, found a very good rock area uh, uh, under the curve for, for, for both uh, poor response and hyper response, which are close to 0.8, which means that you can translate this information into the clinical practice. And that's why you have AMH on, uh, as, as a daily test uh, in your uh, IVF clinic. The good news here is that in the last uh, 15 years, there was a, a, a very uh, good improvement in the sensitivity of the prediction of uh, both response and hyper response. And this is mainly due to our improved ability of measuring AMH. This is because of the improvement in the technology uh, in measuring AMH. In 15 years, we moved from the manual ELISA assay to the automated assay, and this led to great improvement and reliability in the AMH test itself. While clinicians uh, may use uh, AMH in uh, the daily uh, practice, uh, well, this is again a very simple uh, uh, concept here, which is behind this uh, strategy. And the higher the value for the AMH, the higher the ovarian reserve, the higher the risk of OHS assets. So you can use this information to deploy strategies uh, in order to possibly reduce patients at risk for poor response and a happy response. Very often clinicians use this information in order to, to, to manipulate uh, uh, ovarian response in ovarian st stimulation cycles uh, in order to possibly increase uh, the uh, percentage of women having a so-called normal and safe ovarian response. You have here Probably the first experience is published <clears throat> on the so-called AMH stratified care. The concept here is that you can uh, identify three or four categories of AMH uh, uh, strata, and you may propose different strategies, uh, uh, different uh, uh, studying doses for FSH, uh, different use for generate uh, uh, analogs, uh, again, in, with the objective of uh, uh, reducing uh, risks and complications. And the, this is a trial. This is a prospective trial run in uh, uh, Vietnam uh, uh, some years ago. Uh, again, authors identified here three different strata for the MH, MH below 0.7 from 0.7 to 2.1 nanogram ml and about 2.1 nanogram ml. And for the three different uh, categories, they proposed a different uh, FSH starting dose. And this is the result here. The rate of hyper-responders, hyper-responders uh, seems to be uh, very, very uh, low. The clinical pregnancy rate, very good. And the, the risk of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome was uh, uh, sufficiently uh, low, hence demonstrating that in reality, in the clinical practice, you just may look at the AMH value of uh, your patients and you may take your clinical decision. Uh, we uh, had the possibility of 
uh, analyzing again and again the story, and we found that why AMH is indeed the main predictor of ovarian response to gonadotropin stimulation, still age and day three FSH may have an independent correlation with uh, ovarian response. And so we uh, put all this information together and we created a, a sort of a, a nomogram to guide the decision of the FSH studying those in our daily clinical uh, practice. And um, interestingly, this uh, uh, nomogram has been tested in uh, uh, an independent randomized control trial. The main objective here was uh, uh, to possibly show uh, an increase in the proportion of women with a, a, a so-called normal ovarian response. Patients were divided into two groups. In one group, uh, the, the pe people, patients received uh, uh, gonadotrophins uh, just according to female age, 150 if they were young and 225 units uh, if they were older than 35. In the other group, the dose was personalized according to the nomogram. Uh, uh, no differences uh, between the two groups in uh, fertilization rate or uh, implantation rate or clinical pregnancy rate, but this was expected uh, since the primary outcome of the study was designed was designed to show uh, differences just in a, in a, in a number of eggs. Uh, and this is the main outcome. The statistical significance was reached here uh, when you using the personalized dose of FSH, there was a, a significant increase in the proportion of women with a, a normal ovarian response. And also we found a significant decrease in uh, uh, the uh, percentage of the so-called suboptimal responders. There was a, <clears throat> a decrease in the proportion of women with a, a very high response here. The statistical significance was not reached probably because of the low number of uh, subjects uh, within this uh, subgroup of uh, patients. And what about the relationship existing between uh, AMH and the, the qualitative aspect, which in my view is uh, linked to the live birth in IVF? Well, according to the study, it seems that a relationship is there. In particular, for women with a low AMH, it seems that they may have a lower chance of getting pregnant. Uh, in the IVF uh, uh, clinic. And this was uh, uh, confirmed in a, a, a recent meta-analysis uh, in which uh, 13 studies have been included for a, a total of uh, uh, 68. Uh, authors found a good relationship, the good relationship existing between AMH and the, the live birth, uh, but the discriminative ability was uh, was uh, not so good. This means uh, that what AMH is related to the possibility of uh, uh, pregnancy in IVF, uh, the power of this prediction, the power of this relationship is not high enough to permit to you to discriminate uh, between women who will get or will get not pregnant following uh, uh, IVF. But AMH is an independent, an age independent predictor for the chance of getting pregnant. I mean, the prediction is low, but in any case, it may add an information. It may add something on the top of female age. And so we found that we, 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 can, we can improve the prediction of uh, a chance of live birth in the IVF population by uh, uh, analyzing uh, uh, age and AMH of uh, uh, women as two independent predictors. So, for example, even in young women, the lower the AMH, <clears throat> the lower the chance of live birth. And we calculated here this uh, uh, compl complicated formula. Interestingly, this formula has been independently tested uh, by uh, someone else, by the group, by the group of school Nelson in, uh, in, in the UK. They are uh, prospectively included more than 800 women undergoing their first IVF. And uh, you see here on the X axis, uh, you have the predicted probability of live birth according to the uh, to our formula. And on the Y axis, uh, you have uh, the observed, the actual 
chance of live birth after the IDF. Interestingly, all the points are really close to the line, which means that this model has a very good calibration. In other words, you have here three points, old women with low, normal, or AMH. For these women, the chance of live birth was predicted to be low, normal, or good. But in reality, others found low, normal, and good chance of getting live birth. This means that, in, at least in the IVF setting, AMH, uh, having high AMH really may represent uh, reproductive uh, uh, advantage. Uh, uh, and this has been uh, confirmed in a very uh, recent and large observation uh, coming from America. This study is based on uh, the analysis of the US registry for IVF. Uh, more than 44,000 patients included in this study. And as you can see here, you have here the relationship between live birth and female age. Uh, and in green and yellow, you will find women with low MH, so women with reduced ovarian reserve. So it is very nice to see that in all age groups, even in young women, having low MH was associated to reduce chance of live birth. Others found that MH was an independent predictor. The odds ratio was 0.87 for low versus normal AMH values. So we always say that we need the randomized trials or prospective studies before being conclusive on uh, uh, some new hypothesis. And we have here the post hoc analysis of the Megaset trial. This is a very nice trial because it is well large enough, including uh, uh, more than 700 patients. All patients, they were young. They were below the age of 35. All women were treated with the same ovarian simulation protocol. All women received the single blastocyst transfer. And in the post hoc analysis, uh, women were divided according to AMH, below or above the median value. So interestingly, women with different values of AMH, they had a very similar age. Let's see the IVF outcome. Well, the fresh, the life, the fresh life birth rate was significantly lower in women with lower, uh, lower AMH. But again, be aware that the female age here was the same. There was a significant increase in the proportion of women with a, a blastocyst, with, with, with sovranumerary blastocyst to cryopreserve. And so, expectedly, I will say the cumulative uh, life birth rate uh, was significantly higher in women with high MH. So, again, it seems that having high MH independently of age may indeed represent the reproductive advantage in the IVF program. Nowadays, we we all are analyzing the cumulative life birth rate as the main outcome in, in, in uh, 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 IVF, in the IVF program. And now we also have studies showing a good significant relationship between uh, basal AMH and the cumulative life birth rate. As you can see here, again, even in young women, having high AMH was associated to a significant increase in the cumulative life birth rate. Very recently, we had the possibility of analyzing the relationship existing between AMH and the euploidy of blastocyst in PGTA cycles. And we published this article uh, analyzing more than 500 PGTA cycles, including more than 18 blastocysts. The objective here was to see what are good predictors for the number of euploid blastocysts for uh, our uh, patients, and we found that female age, the number of uh, mature oocytes, and the serum concentration of AMH were three independent predictors for the number of euploid blastocysts for our patients. In order to uh, uh, give the idea of what is the weight of this association, we calculated the probability of having at least one euploid uh, embryo 
for the transfer. This probability is uh, decreasing by 16% per every increase in female age by one year. It is increasing by 27% per every increasing in AMH by one nanogram ml. And it goes up by 9% per every increase in the number of mature oocytes by one. Um, interestingly, <clears throat> these results have been uh, at least in part confirmed by an independent uh, group uh, from, from Toronto, Canada. They could confirm that AMH was uh, independently of age associated to the possibility of adding euploid blastocysts. And so, in my view, uh, uh, AMH uh, may be AMH and the ovarian reserve, the extent of ovarian reserve may be independently of the number of retrieval sites being associated with a good quality and good chance of uh, getting a, a live birth. So, dear colleagues, uh, let me uh, uh, come to my uh, conclusion. AMH is the most powerful hormonal marker for ovarian activity and the low uh, AMH uh, may be associated with a, a reduced ovarian reserve and reduced time to uh, menopause. Serum AMH seems not uh, be related uh, to spontaneous uh, fertility in the general uh, population, at, at least when we uh, measure uh, fertility with uh, the, the possibility of uh, having a urine positive pregnancy test, but we, we saw that there is the possibility of uh, 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 an association with uh, uh, the miscarriage, the risk of miscarriage. And so we urgently need uh, uh, proper status uh, with a live birth as a, uh, the main outcome. Uh, AMH is strongly related to oocyte yield in IVF and to the possibility of having an extreme ovarian uh, response. So it may be the basis uh, 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 for the development of strategies for ovarian uh, stimulation including the selection and the choice of uh, the proper dose of uh, uh, FSH. Since ovarian response may be predicted still from the first time you are uh, counseling uh, the couple, we can use this information already when, uh, when counseling, as I said, for the first time uh, the couple. And markers of ovarian reserve may increase our possibility to correctly inform the individual chance of success, what I used to call the personalized prognosis uh, in IDF. The probability of having at least one euploid blastocyst uh, for transfer may be considered a new intermediate outcome uh, of interest. Uh, if we can predict this probability, I mean, this may be very useful for both clinicians and the patients uh, uh, at, already at the time of the first counseling because it is related to the overall chance of getting uh, the live birth. And this probability, other than by female age, is strongly affected by ovarian reserve and ovarian response to uh, stimulation. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Antonio. It was really a very, very clear and impressive uh, presentation because as you know AMH has gone through phases you know as you said ELISA method two different antibodies and now it's only in the last five years or six years <clears throat> that we have you know a relatively you know stuff like the same method and I'm very happy to see that all the data that you quoted are probably are done with this new method you know, it is, you know, a lot of presentations have dealt with AMH, you know, in a very long, you know, from the early, you know, 2000s, you know, to now. And that, you know, we're, we're not, we're talking about a very mixed um, population because we're not using the same method. So I'm, you know, I'm very, really happy to hear, and I'm sure all our colleagues are very happy to see all the studies are done with the same antibody. You know, I think this is this is really you know really commendable, and I think uh, everyone that is following this webinar, you know, should be happy 
that we are not no longer that we're no longer talking about historic the, the different antibodies we're talking about a new standardized method and you know and it's studies like yours and the people that you quoted you know that has bring this uh, confidence of uh, looking at mh you know i must say this is you know highly congratulatory thank you thank you very much now uh, may I just ask a couple of points, you know, and, uh, you know, and I'm sure, you know, there may be follow up questions from people following this webinar and, you know, we will uh, organize it and we will follow it, you know, to you and maybe you can, uh, you know, sort of like answer or through IVF worldwide, you know, or, you know, just through, you know, personal response. Yeah, now, you know, I think you presented you know, stuff like AMH, and, and I agree, AMH is, um, is a very important measurement. And uh, in our center, we also measure AMH on everybody. But um, we don't, but we don't cut off people with low AMH. You know, there's a couple of slides, you know, that, uh, that was shown that, you know, if AMH is very low, uh, you recommend, you know, stuff like no IVF treatment. And I think, you know, that may be a little bit too um, drastic, but that's not yep. your report. So may I ask personally, you know, if you see someone yep. with low AMH, um, AFC, let's say two, yeah. two andro follicles, okay? Yeah. And, uh, but the uh, FHH is normal, okay? Yeah. So, so you would, yeah. Very, very clear. Uh, I got I got your question. Uh, so uh, let me say that AMH, as you said, is a good marker, but it is not the optimal one, which means uh, that uh, the prediction power is not 100%. The rock area under the curve is 0.8, which means that you may have some false positive and some false negative. First of all, secondly, in my clinical practice, uh, at least at the first IVF, we let all the patients enter independent of the of AMH. Even if the AMH is low, but the patient decide to undergo an IVF treatment, we are using this information, as I said, to counsel the patient. We say to the lady, that because of the low AMH, with very high probability, we are going to get few eggs. And this is no so good in an IDF program. But we go for the first IDF. Differently, if a woman already had previous IVF, we are using uh, the information coming from a low AMH, uh, well, probably to counsel her uh, or also uh, regarding alternative treatments, uh, including egg donation. But we never use AMH as a tool to refrain from the first IVF. Right, I, you know, I, I totally agree. You know, and uh, you know, we, I think, I think there's um, people who use AMH alone to decide on treatment, probably, you know, is a little bit too draconian, you know, and I yep. think, you know, then there's give up, you know, you, a lot of patients, a lot of patients may, uh, may lose, you know, their chance, you know, of uh, getting a child, you know, a, a child of them, of themselves, and force, you know, to go to uh, egg donation or other things. I totally agree with you. Now, let me ask you another question, you know, uh, just, you know, because uh, we are talking, probably talking, a lot of the um, clinicians are listening to this. Uh, let me ask you, if you, um, do you use also always use agonists, you know, and so down regulation, or do you also use antagonists, or do you use also maybe a combination of um, say chromaphene, um, letrozole, and FSH, so that you bring up both FSH and LH? Do you use all these methods, or primarily do you use agonists, uh, down regulation? Uh, are you talking about women with low AMH? 
or uh, generally well, speaking? In general, in general first. In general, in general. Okay. Yeah. So I must say to you that in the last few years, uh, we become a hundred percent center using uh, generation antagonists. Okay. We are not using we are not using generation agonists uh, anymore, uh, unless in some uh, rare patients who had uh, spontaneous ovulation or uh, premature luteinization despite the use of generation antagonist. This may happen. According to our own experience, in particular women with low ovarian reserve, so women who used to have very high basal FSH and LH level, these patients may be at risk for premature luteinization when using the generic antagonist. So in these ladies, probably the use of generic agonist may be considered. Yes, so I, and I totally agree because uh, especially with uh, patients with um, low AMH, uh, agonists, you know, takes too long and for the FSH to work, you yep. know, so, and, you know, so you end up using a much larger dose. Now, when we talk about dosage, would you, in your practice, and this is, you know, again, just picking your brains, you know, we're, we're having a discussion, um, in your practice and in your view, people with uh, low antifortical count, and low AMH, would you go for high FSH, you know, like 375, 450, 600? I know there are people who are giving 900 or 1200 units of FSH. Now, would you rather say, oh, in practical terms, I'd rather have less eggs, and maybe the patient won't mind having another egg collection, you know, to yeah. have more, more eggs and more embryos, rather than pushing very, very hard because a lot yeah. of times when we look at people with very high FSH doses, they may get more eggs, number of eggs, but the mature eggs M2 percentage is not much bigger. And the yeah. good quality embryos is probably about the same, you know, if you only got two or three eggs. Would yeah. you agree with that? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, in, in my own clinic, uh, the highest possible dose is 300 units. We never go above 300 units. And uh, well, uh, I got your point. And uh, uh, well, uh, I can see you that in the last few years, uh, probably two years, uh, we have moved uh, 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 more and more uh, uh, to the so-called double ovarian stimulation which is, as you said, uh, uh, the possibility of undergoing repeated uh, oocyte retrieval in the unit mm -hmm. of time. Uh, but again, fundamental here is the correct counseling of patients. Uh, this is, uh, that's why AMH or answer follicle count is important, because since from the very beginning, you can inform the patients uh, regarding their ovarian reserve, the chance of getting eggs, the chance of getting uh, pregnant after the IVF program. And you have to inform this uh, challenging group of uh, patients uh, that the journey may be longer than expected, that probably we need one, two, three, four, even five oocytes retrieval or IVF cycles before getting the possibility, a real possibility of, uh, of life birth. So, we have to move from one single IDF cycle to a cycle, a program in which repeated cycles are included. I think I, I absolutely agree with you, you know, the, Antonio, because um, because forcing, you know, forcing a forcing a uh, forcing an ovary to respond to prepare the ovaries uh, to prepare the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, oocytes. You may not get useful oocytes anyway, and I think counseling is really counseling is really important because you know I think patients you know you have to look at patients say for instance some patients have uh, low AMH or medium or high FSH but they got a lot of a, a lot of uh, antifollicles. 
And if you wait for this entry follicles to grow, you know, to let them uh, naturally grow a little bit because they are, yeah. uh, because the FS is already high, then you end up, you can end up uh, collecting quite a good number of eggs. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so I think, you know, probably um, your, your normal gram, I, you know, I find it very, very interesting, very impressed. Um, but, you know, if we can also add maybe FSH or FSH is only a modulator, I think mostly it will be AFC and AMH. But you also look at the, the FSH to decide when you, when you will start the medicine yeah. and yeah. also what dosage you will end up using the medicine. Because yeah. if the FSH is already 15, there's not much sense adding medicine at that point. Because yeah. you know, because if you if you give someone three hundred units of FSH, and if you do FSH, say you know, on from three day, day three to say day five, day six, the FSH would only be about twelve, mostly. Yeah. So yeah. you know, so if, I totally agree with you. It's very really high. Yeah. I totally agree with you. Uh, I totally agree with you. What is missing, I think, in uh, in uh, literature nowadays uh, is this concept. I mean, uh, we among people, among patients with low AMH, uh, in reality, we can find different uh, categories of patients. Uh, those with low AMH and normal FSH, and those with low AMH and the high FSH. For this second subgroup of ladies, uh, the prognosis is even worse. Yes. Absolutely yes, I totally agree with you. So that's that's also another another take home message. You know that you know that if we mix the three things together, you know we can decide on the regimen of uh, stimulation or the way of how to prepare the ovary. You know to yeah. obtain oocytes better. Yeah. Well, great meeting you, Antonio. Yeah, I look forward to the days. You know. You know, I already I had a plan to come to Milan in June, but I think I got to move it to maybe November. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, uh, colleagues who are listening to this, Rabina, uh, you know, let's uh, just uh, give uh, Antonio the uh, usual. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, also uh, mindful of the um, take home messages and also the last chance, you know, I really believe one should wear masks in the public, you know, so although the coronavirus supposed to be spread by aerosol and not by air, if you cover yourself, it's better, you know, that because you don't know what other people are doing around you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah. Thank you.